I'm State Representative Seth Grove. Uh, welcome to uh, wonderful Dover Borough, Dover School District. Appreciate um, the school district hosting this important event. And ironically, one of the first meetings uh, I've ever held as a legislator back in 2009, I brought in all my school boards, I brought the Pennsylvania State Employee Retirement System down, and we discussed pensions. And here we are in 2014 discussing pensions. Uh, Paramount, probably the, the, the number one issue facing state government, facing municipalities, facing counties, uh, not only here in Pennsylvania, but across the country. Uh, if you would just do a go ahead home, do a Google search, or obviously with smartphones today, do a go Google search now of pensions, uh, you will see dire circumstances uh, across the entire country. Uh, it's not unique to Dover. It is not unique to 196th District. It is not unique to York County or South Central Pennsylvania. It is a Pennsylvania issue. Uh, between school districts and state uh, pension systems. Uh, there's an unaccrued, unfunded liability of about $50 billion. Uh, you heard the song, if I had a million dollars, if I had a $50 billion, um, should probably be that quote for this meeting. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, discussion with pension reform, with different plans. So instead of uh, having outside sources kind of dictate the policy, I thought I'd bring in my good friend, Mike Tobash, uh, state representative from Schuylkill County. That's right, 125th. The Fighting 125th District. <laughs> That's right. um, he was elected actually the session after I was. Um, he represents the House Republican Caucus on the Employee Retirement Commission, the PERC Board. Uh, PERC Board has a very important role in that any kind of pension plan, any kind of amendment, they have to do the actuarial analysis for it. Uh, um, he also uh, was involved in, in, in many uh, hearings on pension reform moving through because of his role in that process. Um, we, last budget cycle, not this last one, but one before, uh, both the House and Senate did have a full defined contribution plan in front of them. Uh, the PERC board came out that it may have had a cost increase because of the transition cost of moving from a DC plan to a DB plan and shutting off the old DB plan kind of froze pension reform, uh, moving to a kind of like a four, full 401k plan. Uh, it, it, it just completely froze us because we weren't sure if it would be a you know, billion dollar increase to the pensions or a billion dollar decrease to the pension system. So with that kind of analysis, you can't make a good fundamental decision moving forward. So through the summer, uh, Mike worked with the prime sponsor, Warren Kampf, on a, um, what we're gonna, what he's gonna review here, it's a hybrid plan. It's a DC DB component. Um, and just to preface this, how we kind of got in this mess. So it really started with Act 9, 2001. The legislature decided to give pension increases to all state employees, the General Assembly, everybody. Uh, and it was done retroactively, so it automatically increased the cost of the pension system before the ink was dry. Obviously, that was 2001. Uh, terrorist attack, we had a financial collapse 2001. We had another one in 2008. Uh, added. Uh, to the unfunded liabilities moving forward. We had a point in Pennsylvania history where the pension systems were doing very well. So school districts and, and the Commonwealth both decided, you know, the pensions are doing so well, let's not put any new money into the pension systems. At one point, the state's allocation was zero. I don't think school districts ever really got down to zero, but that percentage did drop, and that was used for more spending in other areas of the budget. Um, you know, employees uh, have always paid their 7.5% into the pension system moving forward, and uh, they will continue to do that. Um, so, you know, as taxpayers, as employees, as school district employees, state employees, everybody has a vested interest in getting this right and uh, respecting everybody's point of view in this process. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Mike Tobash and the uh, Tobash Plan for Pension Reform. Thanks, okay. Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. And I'm, look, I'm happy and I'm honored to be here. Uh, we are going around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and we're talking about this crisis that we find ourselves in. Uh, and I appreciate my distinguished colleague, Seth Grove, inviting me uh, here this evening. And I appreciate you all taking some time. You know, I think it's just so important that we try and dispel a lot of misinformation that's out there right now, give people the facts. Uh, it's my belief that when the chips fall where they will, where they should, that we're going to have meaningful pension reform in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I appreciate uh, my colleague inviting me here this evening, and I appreciate you guys all taking time from you know, a beautiful evening uh, here in York County to listen to some information. And you know, I want to make this as interactive as we can. We'll have a discussion, and hopefully people will be able to leave here this evening with a good basic knowledge of what the problem is and what the solution is that we're offering 
uh, and help us uh, do the grassroots work that we need to introduce meaningful pension reform to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, Seth had mentioned uh, that we had a song here, If I Had a Million Dollars, and I was listening to it the other day on the radio. It was just on the radio when I was moving from one place to another, and I thought, wow, that's kind of a, uh, an apropos song because we got a, a lot of debt here in the Commonwealth. And when I did that, I thought back about the, to the budget that we had just passed. We've got a couple of lion items in our budget. It's a big budget, $29.1 billion. And um, we've got some line items in there. One, if you're talking about education, the mobile science and math uh, lab, which I talk to my school districts, I think it's an important line item. It's about $866,000, uh, just a little bit less than a million dollars. And uh, I saw that we've got a line item in there, $998,000, and that's a public safety item. It's municipal police training. Um, so a million dollars, it's a lot of money funds important programs uh, within our budget, but a uh, billion dollars is almost unconscionable to many people. Do you know how long we could fund those million dollar line items if we had a billion dollars? Anybody a mathematician in here? Uh, a million dollar line item could be funded for, Seth, a thousand years. A billion dollars is a thousand million dollars. And we've got a $50 billion unfunded liability in our pension systems in the Commonwealth. It is the biggest problem that we've got in our state budgets moving forward that will affect us for the next 30 years and beyond if we don't get a grip on this, on the, on this situation. So we've offered a plan. And I'll tell you a little bit about the plan. And the plan is designed to do a number of things. You know, the biggest thing in my mind is we need to stop handing out diplomas with debt to our children. And we're doing it right now. We're doing it as a result of this huge underfunding in our, life, in our pension system. So Seth, can, can we move to the next slide? The, the plan that we've proposed is a hybrid pension plan. And as Seth mentioned, uh, there, there's been a proposal, uh, and a proposal in some other states as well as Pennsylvania, to move to, move to a plan that, that is largely favored in the in the private sector, and that's a 401k type plan, a defined contribution plan, where once the employer makes the payment, they have no more liability. It's then managed by the employee, and that's what happens in the private sector. And we took a look at a plan like that. As he mentioned, my colleague Warren Kampf uh, had a house bill, and it was switching to a straight defined contribution plan. We got a perk note on that. It talked about the cost associated with walling off our existing plan, and it turned out to be tens of billions of dollars more to make that transition. So through the hearings, through a lot of work with my colleagues, including Seth, some people in the Senate, some people in the House, some people in the administration, we've come up with a hybrid pension approach, which, which basically does this. It keeps open the defined benefit plan that we've got right now, but shifts it over to defined contribution over a period of time. And by doing that, we could get rid of some of these transition costs. And the actuaries have weighed in that we've got substantial savings under this method. The plan is for new employees coming into the Commonwealth. As I mentioned, it would introduce the first mandatory defined contribution or 401k type pension plan for public employees in the Commonwealth. It will not change benefits for current employees Another thing the plan is designed to do is to rescue the benefits of people who are already retired from the system and the people that are in the system right now. As I mentioned, the fact of the matter is that we are so underfunded that there is a belief that current employee pension benefits are in jeopardy. I can tell you if you've seen the news, you've just seen in Detroit, there was a judge that made a ruling the other day that retired employees will take a 4.5% decrease in their pension benefits. Retired employees work for their entire career. They will now be getting a decrease in their pension benefits. What the plan does, the plan is designed to do four basic things. And the four things are this. Number one, to reduce costs moving forward. Number two, to, to develop savings. Four actuarial firms have weighed in on what the savings are, and the savings are between 11 and $16 billion over the projection period. And as I mentioned, a billion dollars is a lot of money 
This plan develops savings. Number three, to shift risk away from the taxpayer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If you've got a defined benefit pension system, the employer, inevitably the taxpayer, is on the hook for those payments. If we shift over to a 401k or a defined contribution model, we shift some of that risk away from the taxpayer. And number four, the plan is designed to provide adequate and sustainable benefits for future hires moving forward. It's designed to introduce realistic, not make-believe pension policy into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the four basic things that we're trying to accomplish. Let me tell you about what the plan does not do. And there's a lot of speculation. You know, I hear a, a lot of conversation. Well, the plan doesn't do this, and it doesn't do that, and it doesn't do the other thing. I can tell you, it does not immediately eliminate the unfunded liability. We've got $50 billion of debt. There's no magic wand, there's no silver bullet that will automatically erase $50 billion of debt. We have to thoughtfully work ourselves out of this hole. You know, the idea that if you dig a hole for yourself, the first thing you need to do when you're in deep debt is to quit digging. And this plan does that, but we don't snap our fingers and get rid of $50 billion of debt. Number two, offer immediate budgetary relief. You may have heard this, that we're in this situation for a number of reasons, and Seth talked about them, but one of the reasons that we're in this situation that he mentioned is we've kicked the can down the road. In other words, we weren't making our payments. If you had a credit card bill and you expected to get out of debt quickly by just paying the minimum payment, we all know you would not get out of debt quickly. Well, we're not even making the minimum payment at this point in time. Act 120 of 2010 has us on a schedule and we're ramping up quickly, but that quick increase in the pension costs for school districts and taxpayers is putting a lot of stress on our budgets. And because we're not at that point where we're paying the annual required contribution, the ARC, okay, it does not give immediate budgetary relief. What we need to do is get on a path that we're paying a required payment and in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're as lean as we can be, that we're cutting expenses where we can, and quite frankly, we, we may have to look for additional revenue sources. I'm with the government, and I'm here to help. That's frightening. Are we all frightened now? Are we scared? Okay. You know, there's a couple of things that occur to me. We've all heard that phrase before. I think it comes from Ronald Reagan. You know, the fact of the matter is that big problems don't generally occur right after there's been a deliberative course of action taken. Meaning, this government is slower moving than a lot of you would like it to be. It's certainly slower moving than I would like it to be. We've worked tirelessly on this issue, and as Seth mentioned, this is an issue on his first public meeting, he started talking about the pension crisis, and to date, we do not have anything meaningful that's been accomplished. I can tell you, I think we're closer than we've ever been. But when everybody gets together and they start deliberating these different concepts, change doesn't happen immediately. But in 2001, Act 9 put us on a course to get $50 billion in debt. And we need to change that course now to get $50 billion out of debt. Number two, good ideas don't often come from within the walls of the Capitol. That's why I'm so happy that you're all here tonight. This idea was not born from a couple of legislators sitting around a table. As Seth mentioned, I'm on the Public Employees Retirement Commission. And we listened to stakeholders in 2012. We listened to PERC and the actuarial note that they put on switching to a straight defined contribution plan. And through that input, we came up with this model. I'm proud of the model. I'm happy to be promoting it throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But it wasn't an idea that Seth and I sat down one night and figured out. This is, the, the idea is born from stakeholders. And that's why it's important that you're here, because I hope you're here to help. Everyone needs to have this message on public pension reform, and I think they need to understand the facts, not the mistruths, not the sound bites, but the gravity of the situation and reasonable solutions that will help us get out. And then number three, great solutions are not always easily implemented. Again, to get a bill across the finish line, so many factors come into play. Sadly, politics come into play. 
And we're at a point in time right now that I'm afraid that the politics of this issue are overriding the common sense solutions for this issue. But we're working very hard. We're going into different districts. We're talking to members that might have difficulty voting for reform right now, trying to dispel the mistruths. We're trying to get this done across the finish line. And I can tell you, it's my belief it needs to happen sooner than later. We're accumulating about $10 million a day of additional debt in these systems. So we need to make change. The sooner the better. We have a problem. So this is one of my favorite sayings. One of my best friends uses this saying all the time. It's not my circus. They're not my monkeys. It's not my problem. But I got to tell you, every citizen of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania stands to lose a tremendous amount if we don't get this problem under control. You know, I had a young lady uh, that did a press conference me with me the other day, a friend of my daughter's. Uh, just graduated from Elizabethtown College with honors, with an education degree, elementary education and special education. Applied for a position in Pine Grove School District. Kimmy Barone. Her father works for PennDOT. He knows what his pension system is. I showed him this one. I showed this one to Kim. I talked to her about whether or not she thought this would be a great retirement plan, the one we're offering now. She thought it would. But you know what her primary concern was? getting a job. Elizabethtown College graduated with honors, elementary education, special education should be sought after. So she applies to Pine Grove School District. They graduate about 85 people a year. How many people you think applied for that position? One position in the elementary school? How many? 344. You're a little low. 344 other applicants for that one position. I'm hopeful she can get a job in Pennsylvania, but I can tell you we're going to have difficulty filling teaching positions with the huge spike, with the huge increase in our pension cost. I've got a fear for the future of public education if we don't get a grip on this. You know, I talk to people who are seniors, and I talk to seniors. You know what their primary concern is? A teacher who maybe had, uh, or worked, someone who worked for the state that graduated 10 years ago? They're concerned about inflation eating away their spending power. They'd like to talk about a cost of living increase in their pension systems. I can tell you with $50 billion of debt, we're nowhere close to offering a cost of living increase to seniors. We gotta get out of debt first before we can even have that discussion. So I talked to people that are in the system right now and I pointed to the fact that in D Detroit, existing retirees are now taking less of a benefit than they were promised for their entire working career. It's a problem. So retirees are concerned. People within the system, I think, are concerned about the state's ability to pay the pension benefits that they're earning right now and they're being promised. So our children, our children who have, are in these classrooms, in classrooms that continue because of our inability or difficulty in, in replacing positions, are gonna quickly go from class sizes of 25 to 35 or 45 if we don't get a grip on this. We're gonna see narrowed curriculum because there's no question that this pension liability is putting a huge stress on the budgets of school districts. If I had a million dollars, how long should I hold my breath? I'm just gonna make another analogy, another example of the difference between a million and a billion. You know, if, I, if you had a million dollars and you spend a dollar a second, uh, it would last about 12 days. You'd run out of money in 12 days. If you had a billion dollars, you know how long it would take to run out of money? Yes. Day and a half. <laughs> if you had a billion, over 30 years, it's a huge amount of money. If you, if you, ha if you, if you had to run a race and you ran a race and it was a million inches long, it'd be about 15 miles. But a billion, it would be, be 15,000 miles, almost the circumference of the globe. It's a huge amount of money. It's a $50 billion debt. I don't know if anybody's in business. I can appreciate this number. As far as payroll goes, percent of payroll, in this budget cycle, okay, 2014-15, the pension liability as a percent of payroll, okay, in our school districts, is about 20%, 20.5%, okay? 
Over the next couple of years, it's gonna to increase to about 32% of payroll. For every, every $100 we pay in payroll, $30 needs to be dedicated towards the, our pension liability. It's a huge number and I can tell you, it's an unsustainable number if you were looking at it from a business perspective. It makes our public education system very vulnerable. We've had conversations since my tenure in the house about vouchers, about charter schools, about alternatives to our public education system. And I can tell you that every charlatan that comes down the pike is going to get acknowledged if they say they can do it cheaper. Because 30% of payroll is very difficult or impossible for our model to sustain. We talk about jobs at risk, talk about this huge number of billion dollars. So in these next number of years, our employer contribution is going from 3.4 billion to 6.6 .6 billion dollars a year. Our total employer contribution, that's the state general fund, school districts, different state agencies, it's just about doubling, 3.4 to 6.6 .6 billion dollars. That $3 billion difference is equivalent to $60,000, $50,000 a year jobs. We've got to find a way to replace or fund $60,000, $50,000 a year jobs. Funding line items. I talked about it. Funding line items, different curriculum in school. These programs are going to be difficult to maintain if we don't get a grip on this massive problem. So we've got all these line items that we need to fund within state government, important, meaningful services that are gonna be stressed by our ability to pay our pension debt. Issues with underfunding, we've talked about it. Job creation, education, taxes. You know, it wasn't too long ago that Seth Grove came to our the district that I represent, Schuylkill County, and I represent a portion of Berks County, and somebody here mentioned to me Sam Rohr, who was a big proponent of property tax reform and elimination on my way in, okay? And Seth came to the district, and I know that he's got important and meaningful legislation to try and take away some of the property tax burden on citizens. You know, school districts need to, at certain times, increase property taxes, and there's an Act One index that says you can only raise property taxes to this index so that schools don't get out of control and don't raise it beyond taxpayers' ability. But there's a couple of reasons, a couple of exceptions. They can raise it higher than the index. And you know what one of those exceptions is? Pension liability. They can increase it above the Act I index for pension costs. And believe me, those costs are coming at us in a very rapid fashion. Financial stability. I don't know if anyone has seen the news, but, uh, Pennsylvania just, just got downgraded in their bond rating, okay? You know, what does that mean? You know, I don't know, okay, we got downgraded in our bond rating. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like having a mortgage at 6% and the bank calls you up and said, you know what, it's not 6% anymore, now it's seven and a half. We have to pay more for the money, for the debt that we have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So our bonds are a little bit more risky. They're more risky because these bond rating agencies take a look at Pennsylvania and they sincerely question our ability to pay back this massive pension debt. And until we get a grip on it, they will continue to put pressure on us and it's gonna cost more for us to borrow money. The higher cost of borrowing is gonna come out in the form of other budgetary problems. The problem, what and why we the people owe a staggering amount for the benefits that we've promised. I've said it, I need to continue to say it we owe it as taxpayers, we owe the, we owe the bill. Now we gotta find a way to get out of it. We gotta find a way to pay it. The difference between employee contributions plus investment returns is what we owe because we have a defined benefit program that is basically just this. It's number of years of service times a multiplier times final salary is the amount we owe. As Seth mentioned, employees made their contributions. A couple of things happened, okay? Number one, in 2001, we retroactively increased benefits. We, meaning whoever's in the legislature at that time, voted because the plans were flush with cash. They increased benefits. Was it a good decision? Was it a decision I would have made? Look, in hindsight, it was a bad decision, okay? 
Number one, increasing benefits. Number two, the market didn't fare as well. You know, we just got out of this period of time that was characterized as the Great Recession. Okay, so if we have an assumed rate of return of 7.5%, we do less than that, who owes it? The taxpayers owe it. And then lastly, during that period of time, because the funds, the, the funds were flush with cash, there was a decision made for quite a number of years not to pay the amount that we should have paid into the system. So those three things came together to have us underfunded. And who owes it? The taxpayer owes it. The investment returns that we're earning were far less than we hoped, just as I mentioned. How? You know, basically this is it. This is just like anybody's personal retirement plan. We're retiring and we didn't save enough money. We didn't put enough money into the systems. Number two, when we did save, we didn't get the rate of return that we hoped for. And number three, we set some retirement goals that weren't realistic. So we bumped up those benefits retroactively and now we're in a bad spot. You know, when I talk to different people about their pension program, it's a funny thing, and this is one of the arguments. Well, this plan doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, it doesn't do the other thing. But you know, when I talk to groups of people, when I talk to individuals, okay, and talk to them about what pension reform is to them, you can oftentimes get a different answer. For some people, it's pay me what you owe me. So if there's someone in the system right now and they're concerned about, you know, they got two years till retirement, they're worried about getting paid back what was promised to them. Number two, my budget is broken and if I don't get cash now, other things will suffer. We've talked about it, we're in a school district right now and this increase in employer contribution is putting pressure on the budgets of school districts and the Commonwealth. Number three, keep my spending dollars strong. As I mentioned, someone who's retired and haven't, hasn't had an increase in benefits or payment for many years might feel the pinch of inflation on their retirement dollars, they're looking for a cost of living increase. The financial future of the state is in grave danger. We just talked about a bond downgrading. The debt is the root of all of the above. I can tell you if we didn't have this huge debt, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. In 2001, the plans were roughly 134% funded. At that point in time, we weren't talking about pension reform, we were talking about giving more benefits. But let me tell you what pension reform is to me. Pension reform to me is a reasonable, sustainable, realistic benefit moving forward. Just like Act 9 of 2001, when we changed the direction on a path to get us $50 billion in debt, we need to change back to a system that will start to work our way out of the problem. So pension, okay, pension change for me is changing the benefits that we're promising people moving forward. If we can change those benefits to have something that's not make-believe pension policy, something that's reasonable, sustainable, and realistic, we can start to work our way out of this hole. Pay what you promised. It's getting increasingly more difficult. I got ahead of myself and I talked about this huge increase in our liability, in the amount that we're paying in every year, 3.4 billion to 6.6 .6 billion. It's a huge problem. Seth? My savings are gone, I'm over budget. Some school district and government agencies are at the end of their rope. You know, I was in just a school district today, uh, a school district in Schuylkill County where I'm from, uh, and they're talking about merging with another school district. And the school district that's in trouble has about $12 million worth of debt. It's a small district. And uh, they're talking about the way to get out of that, out of that situation. The, the beginning of this conversation of merging these school districts together started with um, the, the two superintendents talking about the pension issue. Because they know how dire their situation is right now, but they also know that over the next number of years, that 3.4 billion to 6.6 .6 billion increase will really be problematic if they don't get this merger done. And even if they get it done, they're concerned about how they're gonna get, it, get through after that. Fixed cost debt and contractual obligations have them handcuffed and the places to cut are limited. I mentioned before that we talk in the House of Representatives and we see different legislation and they have to do with a lot of things that people are concerned about, economic furloughs. If you're a teacher, future contract negotiations 
your ability to get increases in salary if you're a teacher are going to be hampered by the fact that we've got so much pension liability lying right in front of us. You know, I've got a friend of mine who's on the school board and he talks about outsourcing. They're looking at outsourcing other services to try and save money. Any way that districts can save a nickel as a because of this pension debt is going to be an important endeavor. Program and curriculum el elimination. Let me tell you about that. I've got two daughters. Alexia, she's going to college right now. Great student. She loved publications, right? And I know reading, writing, and arithmetic's important. She did well in every subject, you know? But she went in there and she loved publications. I can tell you that there's some curriculum that gets kids up and out of bed in the morning and into school. And I think our schools do a good job of educating them. But you know, if it was just reading, writing, and arithmetic, I'm not so sure how well she would have done. She did great on publications. She's working on that in college. I'm proud of her. I hate, and I hate to, hate to think, hasten to think about what education would look like without some variation in school districts. These school districts do a great job. I'm sure Dover has many extracurricular programs, and if those programs are eliminated, all of our public education will suffer. Seth, that's me. I'm representing Mike Tobash. I've got a hybrid pension plan that uh, we are very close to getting across the finish line in the House of Representatives. I thank my colleague Seth Grove for being an advocate for public pension reform. I thank you all for being here this evening. I'm here now to answer any questions you have. Um, again, it's, Seth has played an important role in continuing this argument to make sure that we get this pension reform across the finish line. Yes, sir. That's a great question. That's a, that's a great question. So, so the question was, in, in 2001, under Act 9, there were, there were retroactive increases in benefits, and members of the General Assembly, which I was not a member at that time, and Representative Grove was not a member at that time either, but they gave themselves an increase in benefits, 50%. Their multiplier was higher than other members in the system. This, the, the plan that I have is designed to make everyone equal, okay? There's no, there's no difference between a clerk and a, uh, an elected official or a judge, okay? Everyone gets the same multiplier and the same benefit. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. This program is not discriminatory. It does not favor representatives. Everyone should swallow the medicine at the same rate. I think quite often state government took a look at a position and said, we can't afford to pay this, but we'll promise something in the future that we really can't afford to pay either, but it's not going to be our problem, right? It's not our monkey. It's not our circus. So we're just going to offer. You also get your Blue Cross and Blue Shield for your prescription plan. That's on the leading That's right. So this plan, it doesn't, doesn't touch health benefits. We're strictly sticking with the pension benefits here. But I tell you what it does. Here's what it does, and, and to your point. This is outrageous when our citizens hear about these six-figure pension benefits that are being paid at taxpayer expense. The plan that I've got is a hybrid plan, and it limits the defined benefit plan to $25,000 per year guaranteed by the state. The rest would be in the form of the 401k, okay? So that you'd no longer see $100,000 pension benefits guaranteed by the taxpayer under this program. It's... Would the people in this new plan be allowed to pick their own? Absolutely. One of the requirements in the plan is that there would be three investment firms that would offer a variety of firms, just like you see a, a, a variety of investments, just like you see in the private sector. So you would have three firms that would offer probably different philosophies as far as investment goes. In other words, do you want to do something that's more internet based or do you want to have an advisor that comes and sees you? But all of those firms will offer a wide variety of, of funds that can be invested in, and it would be up to the discretion of the employee. Thank you. Yes. I'm kind of confused. I know that when for the one, this pension form gets. Sure. Does the Senate have a plan? The House has a plan? Uh, what do you think so far? Are we, if the House and Senate not together, 
Thank you. Thanks for the question. And that question can be frustrating at times. Are we together? Are we even together as a House? You know, there's 203 members of the House and 50 members of the Senate, and you've got the administration. I can tell you that, uh, that through the PERC meetings, okay, we listened to testimony, we developed a plan, okay? And after we did that, um, I went to, to my friend, Representative Camp, who had the original defined contribution bill. I talked to Charles Zogby, who, was the, um, who is the budget secretary. I talked to members of the Senate. So we have people coalescing around this idea. Senator Brubaker, who has a defined contribution plan in the Senate. Senator Brown, who is the author of Act 120, the pension legislation that we've got in place right now in the Commonwealth, as well as Warren Camp, myself, Chris Ross, Seth Grove. Many of my colleagues are for it. But is everyone for any is everyone for anything that we do, you know, within the House of Representatives and the Senate? I can tell you that people have coalesced around this plan. I think this is the favored plan by the majority of the body. But look, it all boils down to votes from individual representatives and senators from individual districts. That's one of the reasons that I'm out here tonight, to talk to you and to try and dispel any rumors about this plan and to try and build support so we get across the finish line. It's not as easy as I'd like it to be, and it's not as fast as many of us would like it to be, but I think we're getting closer every day. Yeah, so some, some political background on your question, I think is what you're looking for. Um, so we had this on the floor. We had, was it 15? 14. 14, 14 House Republicans, but with the Democrats to put this back in the Health and Human, or the Human Services Committee, which has nothing to do with pensions, but the person who proposed the uh, motion to do that was the chairman of the Human Services Committee. Uh, we were able to leverage it out of there because he, was, he wasn't going to move, he was just going to leave it go. So we were able to leverage him, bring it back on the House floor. Uh, before we, the budget broke, the Senate did move a bill. They, they tried to get <coughs> votes for a more comprehensive plan. Uh, for some reason they did it. They got 50 votes to put um, basically all elected officials into a DC plan upon re-election. Uh, that's over in the House. I don't know. If, I don't know if they put that in state government committee. I don't know what committee specifically that is, but they did pass that 50 to nothing. Uh, what we're trying to do in the House right now is to get a comprehensive approach to it. Um, I know Mike and I tell us I, I'm 100% supportive of that Senate version. You know, if we have to start with the General Assembly, let's start with the General Assembly. Keep working at it. Um, it it's, it's a political theory to get it done, but I think we are trying to get something much more comprehensive on the books because even the General Assembly alone is a very small fraction of the overall uh, problem within pensions. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, our, our Senate colleagues support pension reform. Um, I think if, if we were able to um, get this across the goal line, get it over the Senate, they'll take it up, pass it, get it over the governors, but the, the key is moving forward. And again, you know, out of, you need 102 votes, you know, there's 111 House Republicans, 13 voted against it. So simple math, we need to work with our colleagues, specifically those 13, to say this is, this is important. So we get three of them, we're gonna get it. Democrats aren't voting for this. It's election year, governor's on top of the ticket. It's all political. And we've had conversations with some of my colleagues that are across the aisle that are Democrats, and they really don't have a problem with this, but you know what, we're, we're unified, we're not voting for it. We can take it up with somebody else next year, potentially. Because again, a lot of the arguments are Act 120 will work and we need to continue to that work. I would disagree. I would say Act 20 was predicated on short-term spending increases, not substantial pension reform moving forward. So. Sadly, if someone is making a vote based on politics and putting the future of the Commonwealth in Pennsylvania in jeopardy because they're worried about someone getting elected again, that's not the right thing to do. That's not why those people were elected, and that's not the conversation we should be having. Hi. Um, that first of all, I appreciate it. But my question is more is does it seem like there's more a not understanding that? Um, some of the things I've got to be out on, I guess, so on the corporate website, I think this is going to be a $65 billion dollar fund by 2018. So the third year, your plan is going to dig it down 15 billion at best, and you're still going to have 50 billion in assets in the road. But 
like, I had a difficult with getting stuck but we felt like I wanted to try to fix it and are we really going for our own savings? Okay, thanks, yeah. So we hear the argument, hey, look, the plan doesn't go far enough. Again, so the question becomes, okay, what plan goes far enough? You know, what if we went to a straight, what if we, what if on a day we stopped offering pension benefits to all state and public school employees, right? Does that go far enough? You could do it. I mean, contractually, we don't have to offer benefits to people moving forward, but we still got this huge, massive, unfunded liability, okay? And you're right, on the governor's website, it says that we will grow to $65 million if we don't change the if we don't change direction. The fact of the matter is this pension bill changes direction. It lowers costs. It saves between 11 and 15 billion dollars. Does that mean the job's done? No. We're going to have to do additional things. I mean, I mentioned it before, and I have to tell you that there's not going to many be many people that stand up in favor of tax increases, okay? But we've got to find additional revenue sources to pay for the liability that we owe right now. Can property taxpayers bear it? I think the answer is no. If I'm in this school district, if I'm in school districts in Schuylkill or Berks County, property taxpayers have had it up to here. The first thing we need to do is change direction. We've got to stop digging a deeper hole. We need to develop savings in the plan, and then we need to, we need to take a look at ways to raise revenue to make sure that we're paying for the benefits that have owed so far. I have to tell you that I've looked at this to the point that it is maddening, but just like any household, that has got a huge mortgage and has racked up their credit card bills, what's the solution? It needs to be a, a thoughtful step-by-step -step approach. And the first thing is stop spending on those credit cards, lower costs, and start to work our way out of the situation. If there, was a, if there was a way we could snap our fingers and get out of the $50 billion of debt, we would have done it. But it's more difficult than that, and this is a first step. Yeah, and I would, I would again, come back to Act 120 that was passed in 2010 under Rendell. It had substantial savings, billion dollars of savings. But what they did is create a collar. So they deflated their pension payments for a few years to try to smooth it out. What that does is take any long-term savings, front load it, and exacerbates the problem. It, it, literally, it, it literally pushes off the problem for a few years. Uh, the other problem with Act 120 is there was no 401k style component mixed in with it. It's still that DB system that we kept in place. You know, had, had this been put into place in, in 2010, I think we'd be in a better scenario today. And then obviously the collars were put in place and that's something the governor supported. He wanted to do collars in this year's budget, basically not paying the bills. We said, no, we're gonna pay our bills and we paid our bills without raising taxes uh, on the Commonwealth, on, 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 on taxpayers here. Um, so I, I think it's important to point out that this is a, this is a huge shift. Um, finally getting that 401k concept built into our pension plan. Do we need to go to the full DC? Yes, but we need to be smart about it. You know, the DC plan we had on the house floor, two out of three actuaries said it increased uh, costs by billions of dollars and then who bears those costs over the long term. So. Well, uh, I think taxpayers would really see, um, get a lot of morale and see this as a good icebreaker if uh, all pensions for a general assembly were revealed. And I know, you know, you guys have to do it yourself, I promise you yourself money out of our wallets, as I'm sure, you know, it would be much more difficult to repeal pensions for general assembly to come into compliance with Pennsylvania Constitution, which only covers, you know, basically maybe travel expenses. Uh, including the retroactive people who are already retired of the General Assembly, specifically, uh, who were already counting on whatever they had before, and then they got the extra boost. And on top of that, uh, you know, if we can get you guys to go to actual part time, you know, no benefits whatsoever, and uh, set the minimum pay to meeting and income of the district, and then people would really think that guys are working on something. If you, uh, you know, get yourself a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, tight type belt tightening, and uh, you guys are going off of our backs, you know, you, you say, we owe this. Well, you know, what if I didn't go for the guy in my district who voted for that terrible increase, you know? So I, I owe you what they promised themselves, I don't know how to I don't think so.
I mean, that's more of a statement. And, 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 that, and that argument exists all the time. I hear what you're saying. You know, there's no question about that we've got different job classifications within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where people have more enriched benefits than other people. One of the designs in this plan was for all people moving forward to be painted with the same brush. Now, can we go further for members of the General Assembly? Do you want to look for people that only want to get elected um, be, because they're willing to accept lower benefits or less benefits than other state employees? You think it should be a part-time legislature? Maybe you think we should reduce the size of the legislature. I can tell you that we've taken some of those steps, okay? The plan that I've introduced treats everyone the same. There's no enriched benefits for legislators, but it's legislators, but it still does offer a benefit for legislators. As Seth mentioned, the Senate just voted on a plan that would have elected officials, representatives, and senators, okay, under a plan where they would be a straight 401k plan. Okay, I'd be willing to vote for that also. I mean, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, but if you take a look at the savings, the, the plan, the financial, um, the fiscal note on that plan, as we mentioned, as you mentioned, I think it's a gesture, okay, leading by example, I'll agree with that, but it saves over a 30-year period, and I think they even use 35 years, about $600 million, which again is a lot of money, but it's, it's just, it's, yeah. it's not meaningful pension reform. It might be meaningful in the sense that, hey, this shows that this body is willing to step up to the plate, do it to themselves first, but is it gonna get us out of the problem that we're really talking about here today, and it won't? That would be a good first step and a, a good great morale step. booster for the taxpayer. Thank you, understood. Thank you. First of all, you know, all these bad, this, all the bad things that you have uh -huh. mentioned, who made these decisions? You did, not, maybe not you, but all past us. No, people. <laughs> Well, these decisions were made by the legislators. Now, who said and why can't we repeal the 2001 gigantic pay raises for you and, and, and 500,000 other people? You know, it, it just is unfair. Uh, you hear talking points, you know, oh, we can't do this, can't do it. But is it, can we do it? No one said we can legally or, or cannot legally do it. Now, th this is truly, you know, the size of the legislator is another thing. You know, you talk about all these people who are, who are working on this thing. That's the trouble with it. There's too many people. You know, you, you, you will never get to a consensus of what is right or wrong. You talk about the, <clears throat> uh, the uh, school budget, and there's 500 of them in the state. Now, you gave probably 480 exemptions so they can raise taxes more than, than the lot. You know, exemptions are common as, you know, as anything. You know, and this is, it is really bad. You know. uh, the, he mentioned that people are getting $100,000 a year in pension. That's great. They get more in a month than I do a year. And I worked for 33 years for a company. And in 1992, they came and said, your pension is over with. You are now on a 401k. No one could say anything. Starting in January, I had six years that I could contribute to, which is not much, you know. And that's, that is totally, you people are just, you know, are just giving the money away, and it's a typical, and you guys are Demo you guys are Republicans, but the Democrats are just going to give this country away to everybody. Sorry. So I, I appreciate your comments. I feel your frustration. I appreciate your comments. I feel your frustration. Believe me, when I when I go out and talk to groups and I talk to other representatives, this makes perfect sense to me. This is easy, right? Could we do more? Should we go more? Should we should we compel the courts to go back uh, and on a day in in um, May in 2001, they voted to increase benefits retroactively. Doesn't it make sense to be able to go back and, and, and reduce those benefits? But the courts have continued to show that when you're impairing a contract, that they strike it down, okay? So the pension legislation that we've proposed right here has meaningful savings to the Commonwealth moving forward. As I mentioned before, is, are we gonna need to continue to work on this issue from, from every aspect moving forward until we get out of debt? Absolutely. We've got an opportunity right here in front of us right now with a piece of legislation, a bill and an amendment, 
and get 102 votes on this thing, get it passed in the Senate, get it signed by the governor to save between 11 and $15 billion, I can tell you that we are changing the direction. We're getting away from what you've talked about, giving, 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 to getting back to reasonable, realistic, and sustainable pension policy. That's what we're trying to get done. I'm frustrated. I hear your frustration. It's one of the reasons that I tried to get elected and got elected in the General Assembly. You're right. The giveaways need to stop, and they need to stop now. Yeah. It, it, it's just a question here. Here, I pay taxes in this school district for 33 years. This is the first time I've been in the school, and I have two children went through school. I pay for private school for them, you know, and it just is. It, 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 it just is, is really frustrating. And yeah. That's why my house is for sale. And could, good luck. <laughs> You're going to try to do this pension your own because I'm heading for Florida. <laughs> I appreciate the good luck, and believe me, we're committed to getting it done. Boy, there's a lot more hours spent on this than I could have ever imagined. But we're, we're working. Florida's Florida going through pension Florida reform Florida right now, has, too. Florida has tackled their pension. You know, I, I watched papers in Florida have been going there for 11 years, and they have tackled their pension. They have gotten away from that defined benefit, and they're cutting it. You know, have they done? I know they were doing pushing doing. an optional. 401k style. Did that get passed? Yes. It I did? So. All right. And that was only optional. That's not mandated. But data shows younger workers are coming to the workforce want uh, the ability to move. Um, kind of that old sense of sticking with your employer long term has gone by the wayside with the younger generation. So well, no, they, no they, they support the 401k. No company, as a company could survive, like the school district, when 60 to 70 percent of their budget is going towards Oh, salary. absolutely. So here, here's, here's something else I want you to think about. And this is, this is our issue moving forward with any substantial changes to current employees. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled three times, three different cases, that it's a contractual obligation. Now, you can increase benefits, but you can't take it away. That's where they say it breaks the contractual agreement when you pull it away. Three times the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that through our uh, contractual protections in, in, the, in the state constitution. This is also the court that said when the General Assembly in 2005 passed the pay raise, said when the General Assembly came back and repealed it later through outcry, the correct outcry of, of, of citizens, said that the repeal is good for everybody but the judicial system. Every judge in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is still receiving that 2005 pay raise. With that set up, what are the chances of us winning that battle? And that's the right battle. I mean, I mean that, that includes the General Assembly. Those, those benefits need curbed. That's why I think the, the, the sentiment of the Senate, since they couldn't get anything more comprehensive, is start with the General Assembly moving forward, and then we can build from there. I don't, I, I don't see, does that include judges? Did they include judges in that, do you know? I believe every elected. All right, so they included the judges in that. Are the judges gonna roll that upon re-election after their 10-year term, they will all go to a, a DC plan. That's the question. That's why we need term limits. Yeah. I'm not even sure term limits would fix judicial well, rulings. Guys yeah. Been there for 30 years. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to change now. I told you in person, we need term limits. Mm -hmm. Two terms. One in office, the first term in office, the second in jail. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. All right. We're, we're trying to get pension reform done here yeah. in the Commonwealth. Let's yeah. increasing our corrections budget. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, look, I'd like to really go back to a couple of weeks ago when I was watching TV. I think it was on one of the TV, that's a very basic nation's You know, all sorts of politicians. One question maybe one of the politicians was, uh, what better the pension plan? And he says, well, you know, not everybody's going to retire right now. We're just going to, you know, show that off down the road. <laughs> and I said to myself, you know, we're still about fifty billion dollars in, in this, you know, program. What kind of an idiot do we have to run under a city? And uh, and then you then you come back and say that we need the detention costs. I should mix this up. But the eleven ninety eight plan that sets involved in it. It goes to the school districts, two point some percent. But if, if you come in with this in that detention, they think increases what I'm making up. And how do I know that they don't buy by your two point some percent 
unless it's really eliminated. I don't know your percentage. I don't know what you're talking about there. But um, the bill mandates that any money raised through the elimination tax goes back to continue to suppress property taxes through a complete elimination or through reduction. So they, they can't. They're not allowed by law. And then there's triggers in the school code that said if they violate law, uh, money will be withheld from them. And then I, I would say I was the proponent of getting rid of all the exclusions to Act 1. Um, I could not get 102 votes for pension or for special ed. They remained, but we did reform them. Um, school districts would not be able to in, will not be able to use the Act One exceptions for pension to cover their ongoing liabilities because we curved it. It's capped at the compensation of their employees from 2011, 2012. So they can only it only covers the arc increase from that. So it's a suppressing amount. And you can look at the Department of, of Education. They have a clear, distinct website tracking that. And it's a suppressing amount. Um, actually, the largest increase of those exceptions is actually special ed. Very few school districts take them. And it's really on the decline. So it, it, it does allow it, but it's at a decreasing amount. And very few school districts take it. Very few school districts actually utilize it. Some apply for it as a budgetary mechanism, but very few actually take it. Are you, agree are you agreeable that the school boards are going to go along with your uh, 1198? You know, generally the school boards hear about property taxes. Um, I think they will take it serious when it's, when it's enacted. Um, I've talked to plenty of school business managers across the state. I've talked to school board members across the state, here in your county, here in my district. There's support for it. Um, they're looking for alternatives rather than jacking up property taxes. They're looking for alternative uh, taxing sources. And it's locked in. You can't, once you have a Lebanese nation tax, it constantly goes back to it. It's in law. Look it up on the, on, 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 on the website, 1189. You can see clear as day in there. It's a suppressing effect. So these are the same school boards give teachers raises like crazy. And then we're supposed to believe that they're going to buy the what's in your 1198. They have to. It's state law. Okay. And getting back to unfunded mandates, by Governor Rich, who uh, passed his unfunded, unfunded mandates on the key year list. If I was to go to a bank and say, give me $100,000, and say, what kind of calamity do you have? I'm going to pay it. I said, two years down the road, when the economy gets bad, I'll pay that. The economy doesn't get bad. Why do you think I'd go to jail? I mean, what kind of stupidity is this? Pass from other mandates. Is that for votes? Basically, that's what it is to get the votes. You know, I can tell you, and, and again, you know, we're here, we're here talking about, uh, you know, changing the direction of what government has, has done in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I can hear the frustration. The frustration uh, lives right here as well. I mean, that, that's why we, I, have been working so hard on reforming a system uh, that was make believe pension policy. You know, it was a system that said, hey, let's collect $30. We think it's going to grow to 50, but we're going to pay 70, but it's going to be someone else's problem. We can no longer live under that dynamic. And you know, it's a shame. It's just a shame that it's so easy in a time, and I talk about this all the time, that government enters into marginal programs when there's excess capital. So it seems like there's some extra money around here. Give it away, right? But the fact of the matter is we need to make the tough decisions, and the tough decision right now is to give reasonable and sustainable pension policy moving forward, go back, figure out how we're gonna pay the debt that we owe, and do our best to get the Commonwealth, the future of the Commonwealth, out of this hole. That's what we're working on. That's why I appreciate the fact that you're all here tonight. I hear your frustration, believe me. Mm -hmm. The frustration for being in the Capitol and thinking it's the house of immediate gratification. If it doesn't benefit somebody immediately, we're not gonna do it, is a problem. It's a problem we're trying to overcome. Anybody that has not spoke yet that wants to speak? There's a gentleman in the back. Oh, here. Sorry, right yep, here. in the back. No, go first. Go ahead. Uh, I heard Representative Grow the other day, uh, I believe it was him, I don't want to speak for him, but he said that your current plan, the way it is, doesn't have enough votes to pass into the House or the Senate. Uh, was that Grell? Grell. Grell, all right. Yeah, Grell. Um, and I noticed he's involved in features, so I don't know what that connection is. But, um, 
he, he, he also mentioned that, I guess it's the I-20 that was passed. 120. Yeah, 120. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm 120. Or do you want to fix pensions going forward? So why are we talking about fixing pensions going forward? If that is supposed to be fixed a few years ago. The, the savings under Act 120 were about $2 billion for the 30-year period. This would save an additional, additional over Act 120, 11 to $15 billion. I would tell you that the, the $50 billion of debt that we're in requires us to take more aggressive action. All right? You know, Act 120 also didn't do one of the big elements of this plan, and that shift of risk away from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Introduced the first defined contribution plan within this state that ever existed. And as Seth mentioned, it's not such a bad idea. Look, the private sector has gone to that largely, and there's people that appreciate that. I mean, they like the portability. They like the transferability. If you have, a, if you have got a 401k, an IRA, you can pass that on to your children or your grandchildren. You can't do that with a defined benefit program. So there's advantages to this plan also. But it, it takes the risk away from the taxpayer. Now, Representative Grell also has a plan. His plan is a cash balance plan, and I'm not here to disparage anyone else's plan. The fact of the matter is we need meaningful pension reform in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Many people have coalesced around this idea. I would tell you, unfortunately, Representative Grell has not coalesced around this idea. His idea uh, has to do with borrowing pen using pension obligation bonds and then backing off on our current payments to try and get out of this situation, hope that we're going to have enough in, in earnings on the accounts to work our way out of the debt. I quite frankly don't think we should be taking that much risk within our systems. We're taking a lot of risk now. I think we need to have a, a systematic step-by-step -step process. Num step number one, reduce costs. Shift risk. Yes. The other part of that, I got the feeling that since no one's really dealing with the $50 billion unfunded liability, uh, nobody's going to make a decision on any of this dealing with that problem. Well, you know, and it, but it does deal with it. So within this bill, it drives the savings back into the plan, okay? So it pays off our debt faster, all right? So just because, you do, just because you lower costs doesn't mean you need to use them in that regard. In fact, Seth mentioned that originally, uh, because of our tight budget situation, uh, some people, the administration, the governor, wanted to take some of those savings and use it for current budgetary relief. In other words, book savings that won't come for 10 years and kind of use that up for those savings up front, okay? Uh, but there's many members of the General Assembly, myself included, that didn't want to do that. In other words, the, the major crux of this problem is that we've got this huge unfunded liability. It's having all this credit card debt, so we need to lower costs, and as we reduce costs and develop savings, we need to plow them back into the system. This plan does that. Does it do it overnight? We're only talking about new employees coming into the system. If we could do what's, what Seth talked about, you know, go in there and, and retroactively change benefits for existing members, you'd see savings very quickly. But this step is a meaningful step. $15 billion is a meaningful amount of money to start to dig our way out of the hole. I've got two questions. First, I know in your presentation earlier, you said that the actuaries uh, determined that it would just cost too much to wall off the defined benefit plan. What, what, what's driving that uh, number in that conclusion? Okay, so there's so the basic things is so you know the, the concept of the defined benefit plan has the employee contribution plus the earnings from the investments in the account coming up with a number, and then you've got the amount that you need to pay, and the difference is the employer contribution. So if you don't make your earnings assumption, the employer contribution goes up. Okay? Some of the actuaries indicated that as you get to the end of the plan, the end of the life of the plan, you need to have a more conservative interest rate assumption. So instead of the 7.5% that they're projecting, they ratchet it back to 7.25% and, and then 7%. That decrease in earnings comes out as an increase in employer contribution. That's the first problem. Okay, if you ratchet back on your earnings assumption, the taxpayer needs to pay the difference in the earnings, and when you wall the plan off, you've got that problem. That's number one. Number two, you know, some of the actuaries looked at that and said, well, what's the average life of a retiree? In other words, how, people that are in the plan right now, how much longer are they going to work? And that's about 15 years. And if you've got $15 billion of unfunded liability, you've got to come up with that in that period of time. You owe that money when you wall it off. So it's turning that debt into a very hard debt 
very difficult to manage your cash flow moving forward. So the plan that we've introduced here transitions to a defined contribution plan, doesn't wall it off. The actuaries then came back and said, we're not as concerned about those transition costs as we migrate over in a, in a more thoughtful way. So you need that higher than to make that transition. You know, um, you know there, there's something else, and the gentleman mentioned it over here, that you know, on a given day, somebody worked for Pfizer or Merck or SAPA, or, you know, and then they came in on Monday and they said, hey, you, know, you no longer have your defined benefit plan, now you've got a defined contribution plan. Government has another element. You know, government, if, they, if, if, someone, if someone doesn't have retirement earnings, okay, if they're, if they're impoverished, we pay for other services. You know, they're on Medicaid. You know, they're on public housing. You know, they're on, they're on food assistance programs, right? Government pays. So having an element of um, defined benefit going to those public employees. Now, we've ratcheted way down. The maximum is $25,000, but it keeps people away from the poverty level, keeps them off other government programs. You know, the public sector is a little different than the private sector happily or sadly, okay? Sadly, certainly in this room right now, you know, we're not as light on our feet as government because of these contractual obligations as the private sector would be. But if you, if you retire from SAPA and you lost all your money at the casino, you bought a boat and lost the rest of your money at the casino, they're done with you. They don't have to pay it anymore, but the government finds themselves in a position that they're paying other benefits. So another reason maybe to keep a portion of the defined benefit plan open. That's right, government has to pay it. SAPA doesn't have to pay it. The private sector employee doesn't have to pay it. But Medicaid, Medicaid exists for, for, for people that are below the poverty level. Rick, gentleman with the beard and the glasses in the back, he had a question. Uh, 401k approval, 401k financial and some promises paid This one's just a little You're trying to sell a bunch of people who are going to all take the state government as an employee. And you're under the consequences. No one will want to go into the state system. No one will have to work with you. No one will have to So we've done modeling. So I understand your question. And, let me just, 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 and I understand that you just looked at it for the first time. So let me tell you that the portion that you're, not, you're ignoring right here is for, for the contribution, okay? It's a 7% contribution of salary, right? And for the first 50,000, 6% of it goes into the defined benefit portion. So there is a defined benefit portion that exists for that first $50,000 of income, okay? Once you get over 50,000 or 25 years, then all of that money is shifted over to the defined contribution plan. And from the first dollar, 1% goes into the defined contribution plan to establish it, and the state puts in that half, that, that half, <coughs> excuse me, one half of a percent. So when you're saying that, sure, if that plan only had a 1% employee deferral into a defined contribution plan, it would be a meager benefit. <clears throat> but it's a very good benefit when you take the hybrid portion, the defined benefit portion, that would still exist for those employees for salaries under $50,000. So just to clarify, you're saying under the new plan, both defined benefit and defined contribution and employee deferral would be that's exactly right. The defined, the defined benefit pl plan continues to exist for salaries up to $50,000 and for the first 25 years of employment. So you would get a mix. It's a mix between the traditional plan and the 401k defined contribution element. I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about it afterwards. We're getting down a little bit in the weeds on that, but yeah, it's a, it's a mix between those two. And I can tell you that as we model this, it's a very good pension benefit, okay? It's realistic, reasonable, and sustainable pensions, similar to what we're offering in the private sector. No more $100,000 a year is on the defined benefit side, but there is a defined benefit element for the lower, the lower salaries. Well, first of all, this is, uh, I really had no idea I had to be here until I came to the with a friend, uh, she had, had to get up and leave. But the, the one thing, coming from a perspective, I'm 23 years old. And sure. I noticed that quite possibly the youngest part of this room, and I think that 
I walked in here and it's kind of sad I think, to, to see the, the lack of participation because I know there's a ton of people out there who have to pay taxes. There's a ton of people out there who are going to be affected by this. And 99% of them aren't in this room, which is kind of sad. And I think the main reason that being is why my generation doesn't really approach politics and doesn't come out to this stuff is because it's very, very confusing, especially to, to me and the people when I just, just um, try to explain that kind of stuff because no one's not taught anymore. You know, you're not you're not even urged to get into this anymore. I was never even this was never even brought up in, in school to get involved in local government. But really to simplify this is gonna sound really elementary. So I apologize if it's not as fancy as, as someone might like, but my question would be will this increase taxes? This plan is designed to reduce taxes in the long run. Okay, does this have an immediate effect on tax reduction? The answer to that is no, because we're not yet paying the amount that we need to pay to get out of this debt for the next three years, okay? Once we get to that point, and in, through the long term, this will reduce taxes because it saves between 11 and $15 billion over the current system that we're in right now. And those savings will come out in the form of reduced taxes in the future. Think of this as a structural change to the benefit. You have your current benefit that continue to project that out. It's just non-sustainable. Um, this, this, the benefit structure we have today was predicated upon state employees making far less than their private sector um, companion jobs. So the attractiveness is to come to the, 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 the public side was good benefits, good pension. That's changed drastically over the past few years. So as salaries have increased, we're now in line with, with public sector. Public sector had those lower benefit tiers. So in the public sector, we've had kind of the, the, the best of both worlds. That's resulting in the, 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 the massive increases in budgets, local property taxes at the local level. What this does is restructure that benefit to be realistic, to be in the 21st century, provide <laughs> portability, and reduce those long-term effects to taxpayers. And believe me, when you get in a room and you start talking about pensions, people quickly glaze over. Because look, it's not, it's not the discussion that people like to have. You know, the reason that it's important that we're out here talking about this is to impress upon people how important it is for the financial future of the Commonwealth. You know, I characterize it like radon gas. You know, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it's bad for you, okay? So we need to develop savings. We need to do those four things that I'm talking about. Number one, reduce cost. Number two, develop savings. Number three, shift the risk away from the taxpayer. Okay, and number four, offer a benefit that's realistic, reasonable, and sustainable moving forward. If we can do those four things, we're getting ourselves on the right path. Yeah, and I get that. And the main thing, one thing I hear all the time is taking risk away from taxpayers. When you take risk away from taxpayers, I feel you weaken them. Take, you take the risk away. So yeah, they say, you know, the government will say we'll take care of it. And now it's, it's no longer, you're not, there's no risk involved. But you're paying, you're being, you're being forced to be taken care of. And it's, I'm wondering what's going to happen with, with someone, maybe you say it's a temporary increase in taxes, so decrease in taxes. What's going to happen to people who don't have 15, 20 years left? of like, who, what's going to happen with those people? They're, they're going to tap their, their living expenses or their living, what they're receiving isn't going to increase, but their taxes are going to go up. They're already struggling. How is it going to, how are those people going to make it during this time? Like for me, this may, may ultimately change when I turn 45, I don't know, 50, whenever it may be. What about the people who aren't even going to be here in their last 10, 15 years of their life? What, What's going to happen with them? They're, they are receiving the same, but taxes may be less, than, but taxes are continuously going up. So this is, this is let, me, let me get this one. This is, think of this as a, a multifaceted step. Like you could come out with a huge bill that changed everything instantaneously. Could be a good, could be bad. Obamacare. Automatic change, huge bill, does stuff we don't even know was going to do. I mean, you can quote Nancy Pelosi, We'll figure out what's in it after it's done. You can do, take those huge steps and end up with a worse system rather than looking at it as kind of compartmentalizing looking at it. So 
when we're talking about education in particular, we're talking about pensions. That's one issue. Pension increase is one issue in the entire education realm. You have funding, special ed funding. We finally got a change in that. Since 1991, every school district was getting 16% of their student population with the assumption that 16% are special ed. Some higher, some lower, not fail, not realistic. We finally got a change with that. Basic education funding for growing schools, Schoolkill County, York County. We've had a growing population since 1991. We've had this hold harmless clause. It means every school district got the exact same amount of money. So when you have a growing population with the exact same amount of money, who makes up that difference? We have other parts of this state where they've had decreasing populations. And it's cost. Students are cost. Every little body that comes into a school system is a cost. So when you lose that cost by those populations not going up, they have a built-in surplus of money. Um, is it Altoona or Allentown? Altoona is sitting on a huge surplus of money because they've had a decrease in population and they've gotten huge supplements over the years. That's another fundamental point. The tax structure, property taxes is a form of taxation. That's another issue to deal with. Um, so we've slowly been knocking it out and we've made larger headways in these past four years of all these issues combined that's going to change it. Now, people expect that silver bullet. That silver bullet to me is Obamacare. It was a silver bullet, supposed to fix everything. HMOs were supposed to fix everything in the 80s. Hasn't. So it's the hard work, it's the substantial changes that you make today that you're gonna see a few years out. I'm fixing, you know, we're of the same generation. I'm fixing my father's mistakes when he took over leadership of this country. It's a reality of it. Things happened in the past, we're trying to correct them and move forward with sustainability within our government system to make sure we right size it and it works for the people. That's our goal. That's our goal with this plan to make that step forward, that permanent step forward that we correct what has happened in the past. It just takes time to do that. And unfortunately with today's society, it's that instantaneous gratification. That's the expectation of the general public. And that's very hard within our government structure because if you think of our founding fathers, they had instantaneous gratification in a king. It was instantaneous. You may hate it, you may like it, whatever. They went over to a form of system and it was, they designed it this way to be a little slow and forced compromise. Um, so if you want to go back to instantaneous comp, uh, that instantaneous gratification, that's your dictatorship, that's your monarchs, that's not what our founders wanted. And I don't think that's really what, what the American people want. So it does take time and it takes effort. You're dead right. You're dead on. This is the largest issue that we face in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania largest issue. Now we have some people here, not necessarily from Dover, from the 196th district that came out for this. I appreciate they care. It, it's unfortunate. I know pensions, it's boring, boring, boring stuff, but it is so, so important because it drives everything that's happening in every single budget from school districts to municipalities to the state. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you did hit on one thing, I know that sounds like it's me about, but I know that um, it's important, and I think that maybe some people can call it that. You said that the cost of schooling is going up, but they're only receiving the same amount of money. So, yeah, so um, we, for every increase you give, so when the state gives increases to school districts, there's hold harmless built into it. So what that says is every school district will get the same amount they got last year, and then the increase gets divvied up in a new way. So what that has done is school districts with a growing population have higher costs than those with decreasing student populations. So there's school districts in this commonwealth that haven't raised property taxes in 20 years because they've been slowly having less students. Less students means less costs and as someone retires they don't have to replace it and they can slowly manage their budgets through that. In growth areas, because it's not predicated on actual need by any means, um, local taxpayers had to fill that void moving forward. So really, and, and with the basic education coming in, I'm telling you right now, it's gonna to be tough to get past because there's many of us who want that change to get rid of Hold Harmless. So when we allocate that basic education funding formula, we're doing it per student every year. So as your student population grows, you get money to, to fund those kids and it should be based on each student. There's no reason Dover students get less money than Duquesne students in Pittsburgh. They're students, right? We're all equal. 
Um, so there, there's really a constitutional and, and really a, a um, fundamental problem with giving each student a different amount of money each year. So we, we have to build and we're going to continue to work on that. And like I've said, we've made great strides. It will reflect over time. And that's really what you want. You want those good changes that fundamentally change the way we do things. It takes time to get there. It takes patience. But we can get there and make the Commonwealth a much better place for everybody. You said um, that it, obviously the, the school, the budgets are going to increase. And I, I, I mean, I know from a generation, I know probably I would say hundreds of kids who have gone through this, this education system. Mm -hmm. and done, they've been in there, they've gone to the standardized testing and all this kind of stuff that they put in. And they kind of like, I don't think it because I think it kind of treats people like drag animals and you get them all doing the same exact thing. And you send them out into an ancient system, and I see kids getting out of school working for minimum wage with big degrees and a mortgage of debt, and it's like we're, the taxpayers are paying for these systems that aren't working, and they're sending kids out into a broken society or a broken system, you know, a, an ancient educational system, and now they're funding it, they're putting more money, at causing taxes to go up to fund things like standardized testing and stuff like that to increase productivity, but then you see all these kids, all these children that are 18 year olds graduating, and many of my generation are not using the degrees that they did to, they're working for minimum wage, they're struggling, they're, they're leveling credit because that's their only option, and it's, it just seems like, is the school, is increasing the school budgets, all of this, to an end, like I said, this is elementary. It's, mm. it's not, I'm not talking politics, I'm talking, yeah. is this going to make for a better life for us, or is it going to just keep spiraling? Yeah, so, and, and that's, that's what we're, we're discussing here is kind of like that financial. You're talking about kind of like that education policy. Where is education heading into the future? So, assessments are required by No Child Left Behind. That's a federal law put in place by President George Bush. There's nothing excluding running for Congress or the U.S. Senate, and God help them. Um, after Todd retired, I thought about it for 30 seconds, and then I'm like, how do you fix that? I had, I had no solutions how to fix that. I know where I want Pennsylvania to go. I know the direction. I know the issues. Whole other animal down there. But that's something um, D.C. is going to have to tackle and fix. We're mandated by them. We have to do it. Um, so you have, have the testings. Um, the other aspect is pushing kids towards college. Um, and that's, that's been a big thing for decades. Go to college, go to college, go to college, go to college. Yeah. The, the real thing out there is you're, 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 you're diversifying it and focusing on your technical schools. Thaddeus Stevens over in Lancaster is probably one of the best educational hidden gems in Pennsylvania. 99% rate of employment after graduation. It's a technical school. Um, you're not going to outsource plumbers, electricians, those technical jobs. Um, I'll, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, welders in just in South Central Pennsylvania. If you graduate as a welder, you will have a job forever. There's 3,000 open welding jobs in South Central Pennsylvania, eight counties. Um, it's always on demand. It's now a little more technical. If you go over to um, Harley, York, a lot more technical, a lot more robotic, but you still have to have those basic welding skills moving forward. There's a lot of jobs out there, and it's retooling kind of those individuals thinking outside the box and moving them. Um, we do FIA grants. Uh, one of the neat things we did was include technical trades to be able to get actually FIA grants to go to technical schools to, to help support that moving forward and stuff. So there's a lot into that education policy aspect of it. You know, we just did teacher evaluation system to try to bring um, hardcore data into that to check student growth moving forward. Um, we redid our um, standards to increase the standards because we're having real problems of kids graduating and heading into remediation. You know, after you spend billions of dollars in taxpayers' money in K through 12 education, I think you should have that simple expectation that you don't need remediation in college. You should be able to go to college, have a fundamental understanding of those college kids and not have remediation. Huge growth problem. So the better off, the better standards, it's kind of accountability, taxpayer accountability. The more accountability, because it is statewide taxpayer money going into um, school districts, the more accountability we are, hopefully the, the better outcomes we will have. And it's been shown. So hopefully that addresses some of it.
Yeah. If we don't have pension reform in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, everyone in this state will suffer. From retirees to current people in the system to people that are yet to get jobs to the kids that are in classrooms right now. We've got to get pension reform done. Uh, a couple of things, but the, uh, this is a, the, the technical question. The employee contribution is 7%. Um, I'm not trying to ask that for 1K. I'm not choosing how much I put 10% or how much I put 3% in. I'm assuming that 7% is set to you know, cover the $50 billion of debt that is coming in the future, or uh, we feel like we need to assign state employees. Is it, you have to say it is a percent. So the magic of that number is that we, um, that we set a number there to cover the normal cost for people within that system. The normal cost is the cost associated with that person earning its be his benefits that day, that week, that month, that year, uh, that are set aside at the assumed interest rate to pay the benefits. Uh, it is not designed for them to pay extra to pay down the debt, but it's making sure that we've got enough assets in that plan to pay for the benefits we're promising in the future. The, uh, you spent a lot of time uh, talking about the financial aspect. I, first of all, I'd like to take it as long. I do think it's the most important challenge for you to come over with Pennsylvania. Um, my wife is a school teacher, so I have a uh, kind of a, uh, a different look on this. And uh, I think everyone would need to be concerned about those findings is that we always have to be uh, concerned about the, the education that our kids are receiving. And I can tell you, um, class size is growing. Uh, and now the <coughs> school for critical learning is taking place as we're up to you know, 30 students in some of our, of our classrooms. Um, I believe the reason we're up to 30 students in our classrooms is because we cannot afford to hire enough teachers to bring that classroom size down. The reason we can't afford to do that is because of what we're paying attention to. And that is managed, and that is critical. Uh, I think about that the union perspective. My wife is paying the union duty every time she gets paid. Okay. Um, teachers are being laid off, 87. Uh, so I'm not sure if there's 5, 10, 15 years worth of union duties, how that's helping the that. Um, and uh, I'm guessing that the, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the teachers union is not bad this is more. No. Uh, I have great, grave concern about the, about the union's uh, perspective on this legislation. I think that, as I mentioned before, I think the future of public education is at stake right here. I don't think they've got their current members' uh, best interest uh, at heart when they're trying to block meaningful pension reform. Um, so we have young people that want to become teachers mm -hmm. that are being blocked by a pension plan that the state cannot afford, the taxpayers cannot afford. We have taxpayers that are maxed out and we can pay taxes. And we have kids that are getting an, an inferior education because of this. Keep driving for this. The change needs to happen. Everybody is losing with this issue. Our students, each of us in this room is taxpayers, and the teachers by not having any jobs available for the next generation of educators. So keep up the charge. That's not really the question. But, yeah. um, this, is a, this is a huge issue. Yeah, I just want to applaud because I think it hits. The, the, the political issue with this. You know, this isn't about going after teachers and going after the education system. It's about trying to improve it and make it better for everyone. Current employees, future employees, the students, the taxpayers, everybody. And to have an entity out there to say no for outside other political reasons because it's a governor's election um, is a huge disservice to, I think, everybody within the system. And I think your comments speak clearly and concisely to the reality of, I think, every individual within the system, actual people who this affects, employees, the taxpayers, the kids, everybody, at why we should do this. So, I know, I know the kids that are coming out of college that are looking for a job in education are in favor of this plan. Every teacher that's in the system right now should be in favor of this plan because we need to rescue the benefits that they've earned and we need to rescue public education. Thank you. Green shirt. If you have a couple of plans that uh, you want people to look at as a possible, put it on the ballot and say, are you in favor of this and this and this? So the representatives can say that, gee, 80% of the people in my district are in favor of this and I'm not doing it for it. So, <laughs> we, Pennsylvania ballot access is we put stuff on the ballot, the General Assembly. Some states, you know, California is probably the, the predominant um, 
ballot initiative state where individuals can petition and put it up. This is probably a little more political than what you want to hear, but most, most ballot initiatives try to drive other election outcomes. So if, if, you put, if you put a ballot initiative that says we will legalize gay marriage in Pennsylvania, obviously the court already happened. It's really not about that issue. It's about driving those people that support that issue that are more than likely to vote for a certain particular person on the ballot. It's to drive overall ballot access. And you can see uptick in certain ballot initiatives because one en entity will do this one, one entity will get that one and try to drive people out. Um, generally, most people don't understand ballots. Probably it's our attorneys. <laughs> that draft them in a way that nobody understands them to begin with. So you get in there, you read this thing, and you're like, no, because you don't understand it. And if you don't understand it, the same thing is to vote no, just to make sure nothing happens that you don't understand it. Um, we could probably put up a, a different plans and do that. Um, probably the big issue is just getting on the ballot to begin with, because the same entities, the same forces that are fighting this would fight that, because, you know, if Thinking about it, I would do you know uh, a, a full DC. I would do a hybrid plan. I might do the cash balance plan, like three different benefit structures. See which one would win. Um, feasible. Then you have the the palpability to say you know the people decided this, and we need to move forward with this. Um, it, it definitely has it, but those changes would be fought by the same entities. Um, you know, I'm 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 a supporter of right to work. Uh, we've talked about just doing a ballot exercise, putting on right to work. Do you, do you support it or don't support it? At the end of the day, we'd have the same political fight of just getting a ballot initiative as we'd be getting the policy. And, it, and if you just do the ballot, you just have ballot and you have basically a um, giant poll of Pennsylvania that says they support it. You still got to get the policy in place afterwards because we have non-binding um, ballot initiatives here. Yeah, I would tell you that the, that, the, that the nature of this issue, okay, I think it makes it difficult to put on a ballot, as this young man just mentioned before, take a look at this room. I mean, I don't know how many people were invited to this session. Uh, I the think world, that, invited the world. The world was invited the to this session, invited. and that we're on the radio today, and I think that this auditorium should be packed because it's an important issue that infects everyone in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I appreciate the fact that you're all here, but we ought to have more people here. Uh, so we got apathy. And then we got the complexity of this situation. I like to, you know, the, the, you know, pickles. Look, we're in a pickle here in the state of Pennsylvania. I wish we could get politics out of this thing. If we strict stuck to principles, this would be a no-brainer. I mean, I've only been in here since 2010. We've worked really hard on an issue that is good for the future of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And to think that there's members that are going to make a political statement uh, against voting for something that's going to affect this commonwealth for the next 50 years is very disheartening to me. Putting it on the ballot, I'm not sure, is the way to get this issue resolved. But we've got to take politics out of this. People need to take a look at the issue and their principles and vote for what's good for the future of the commonwealth. So, good comment. I'm not just sure we get it done, something this complex, with, with that method. I just have one quick question, please. Pension stands right now. You're invested in the stock market and such, right? Yeah. The Bailey, if you lose in the stock market, <coughs> does that mean the taxpayer has to pick up the difference to pay it? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to preface that. That's the current system. The I current system the current is that. System. Yeah, yeah. So what we're trying to do is move away from that. That, that defined contribution system uh, protects the taxpayer because any, any money lost there is on the, no, just like the private sector. IRA, so. Lose, yep. Yep. Let me let me give you another let me give you another frightening. I'll, I'll frighten you with this number right here. Okay. So the interest rate assumption is seven and a half percent, right? Under our current system, all of the risk is borne by the taxpayer. If we only earn five and a half percent, it changes the savings from fifteen billion dollars, okay, to fifty-four billion dollars. The taxpayer is at great risk right here. Changing this system is so important because if we don't make our interest rate assumption, the news is even worse. Thank you for seeing the uh, You mentioned that you employed the uh, uh, the, 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 the 
under it, and I felt Timothy the future to follow the God. <coughs> Uh, made a decision to pay benefits without a federal plan to pay for it. Uh, both of uh, you gave us an interesting outline of the plan. There's one thing I'm missing on it, and that is under the defined benefit, which I understand is uh, something that's going to go for 25 years. I see the employee contribution of 6%. Uh, and I see below in the defined contribution, what both the employer and the employee will contribute to the plan. Am I missing something in the middle of the page as to what the employer contribution will be in the defined benefit portion of the plan? So, so the answer to that is it's a variable. Because it's a defined benefit plan, the employer pays the difference between the employee contribution and the earnings. And that's a, it's a, it's a variable. Okay, okay, that's, 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 that's a good answer. Uh, as, a, as an indicator, if I work on I'm thinking about 4%. Because the right guy had the same old plan, can you read the future? Apparently, in 2001, under that economy, they couldn't read the future. They did not know that the stock market was going to fall. They did not recognize the terrorists, and they did not perceive the fallout in 2008. So, what makes it? You know, it's still a defined benefit. The state still doesn't make contributions. Well, that goes zero to, and what guarantees are that the state, that someone said up there, I think it was set. Some years the state government, state legislature decided to put zero contributions into the fund, which gave us some of the problems we have now. What's going to prevent the decision in the future? Thank you for listening. Oh, you're welcome. And I would hope I got a little better than 40% on that because it is, a, it is a variable number, right? What is to stop future legislators from making a decision to not fund the defined benefit portion that remains open in this plan? And, and the answer to that question is future legislators will have to make that decision, okay? This is a major shift to defined contribution. It's a shift away from taxpayers. But that portion of the defined benefit plan that stays open still bears some taxpayer risk. It's no longer going to be triple digit taxpayer funded defined benefit plans. It will be capped at $25,000, 50% of the $50,000 limit. So we're ratcheting back on that defined benefit plan, but you're right. If we don't make the interest rate assumption, it will be worse than we've characterized but far less worse than the system we're under right now. The difference in the savings, if we go from 7.5% to 5.5%, is another $39 billion over the next 30 years. So does it shift all of the risk away from the taxpayer and the Commonwealth? No. Does it shift a major amount of the risk away from the Commonwealth and the taxpayer? Yes, and that's what it's designed to do. I have one other question. Uh, you talked about the projection period for savings. What's the projection period for your plan? 30 years. So no savings until 30 years old. Oh, no. No, there, there's safe. No, there's. Explain that. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's savings developed through the projection period. So the actuaries take a look at this thing on a 30 year projection period, okay? Under the first number of years, okay, because we're only treating new employees coming into the system the savings are much less until we get more people into this new program that lowers costs. So the savings, um, you know, I'd have to take a look at the, the, act, the actuarial, the amortization schedule. The savings build over time, but in the first day, there may only be one person in this new plan and the savings at that point in time are meager. Yes, sir. Does, does the government have the authority to move money to the pension plan? So the governor, the governor has the ability to put money into reserve accounts. So um, Governor Rendell did it. I think it was two thousand nine, two thousand ten. He, during the mid-year budget review in December, the governor can put money in reserve. He can't reallocate it anywhere. It just gets put into reserve to hold for the next budget year. So basically, the budget outline projects money where it's supposed to go in statute. So he doesn't have the ability to say, 
I'm going to take pension money out and put it somewhere else. Um, that's done at budget time to clearly define where money goes. And basically, Social Security, um, all state and generally all state employees are getting Social Security. There are some that are not. State police are not in the Social Security system. And that's it. That's the, it. The only classification that's not does not participate in Social Security is state police. Every other Commonwealth employee participates in Social Security. They make their Social Security contribution, and the employer makes their six and a quarter percent. Yeah, and that's important too, because benefit structures are the three-legged stool. It's your pension benefit, it's Social Security, and whatever you save. That's that's the three. So if 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 you're predicating your entire retirement on just your pen, pension benefit, and that's all that you have, that's that's not the way you should be setting yourself up. Um, you know, Social Security, do I expect to see Social Security? No. <laughs> so I am not planning on retiring with Social Security. So my pension plan is whatever at the end of the day I retire with and then I'm putting money in 401k, I'm putting money back in savings, I'm preparing for that inevitable future that Social Security will go by the wayside for my generation unless DC somehow magically comes up with real solutions to real problems, so. And you can see it. I mean, um, as bad as Pennsylvania's budgets or pension system is, local municipalities in far worse shape. Scranton is on the verge of Detroit. York City is not bad. Anybody here work in York City? Um, they may be coming out with a commuter tax. 74% of York City's revenues go directly into their pensions. Um, that's a scary thing. I don't want anybody paying a, a commuter tax whatsoever. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the missed opportunity here. And, and I don't want state taxpayers' money going in to bail out poor decisions of local municipalities either. That's not fair to taxpayers. But we need to alleviate those burdens for, for the local governments as well. Um, kind of ironically, we were having that discussion of who Dover's actual state senator is right now. Um, based on law, before, right now it should be Alloway. Someone called his office, he said it's Wagner, but actually, so effective December 1st with redistricting, it's Vance. Call them both. Um, I don't know specifically how they voted on anything. I know with the, with the legislator only plan, it was a 50-0 vote, so they both support that mechanism. I haven't seen any public statements on it. Knowing Rich and his positions, um, I would say he supports a complete overhaul in pension reform. I don't know where Pat's at on this at all. I have not had that discussion with her. As far as House members, um, it was, if you pull up House Bill, was it 1353? 1353, look at the House roll call votes for reconsideration back to the Human Services Committee. You'll pick up those um, 13, 14? 14. 14 House Republican members. And then obviously every single Democrat in the House voted for it. So that would be, you can get names off that. I don't know off the top of my head, but. But I'm missing, what if the major political pushback, Democratic or Republican, we're talking about a program that is just for new employees in the state system? Governor's election. Just the election. Just the election. The election. Giving, Tom Corbett a, to giving Tom Corbett a win right now is the political issue. 
Can you believe how sad that is? Can you believe that representatives would get up in front of a group of people and they'd talk about something that they didn't like about the plan, but the underlying theme would be that if you were a Democratic member and you didn't want to give the governor a victory or upset the apple cart when you thought your candidate was going to get in, you weren't not going to support anything. It's a sad commentary right now in the system. Um, quite frankly, it's not the reason I got into politics to get reelected. Uh, if it ever becomes that, uh, shame on me. The fact, the fact is that um, it is unconscionable to me how we wouldn't book between 11 and billion dollars of savings in a program that is so grossly underfunded when we can see the effects that it's got on school districts, the future of public education, the future of the Commonwealth, other budgetary reasons. So, you know, to your point, the reason that I'm happy that you're here tonight is, um, you know, your ability to reach out to other senators and representatives and make your opinion known um, until you go into the room, the hall of the house, and you press a button, you're not sure how anyone's gonna make a vote. I think that we've got tremendous support for this plan. We're a couple of votes short. That's why we're doing our work right, hat right now in this summer session to try and make sure that people understand the facts, not the myths, dispel those myths, and uh, hopefully when we get back uh, in the not too distant future, we get this thing across the finish line. Yeah, and, and if you're looking, you know, if you're thinking, what can I do to help this? Um, letters to the editor, get active, get engaged. Uh, people see it, uh, building that, that public support and, and scrutiny of, of everything is a good thing. Um, so, you, you know, what you do, I mean, we can't do this alone. You know, when, when, if, if I take a bill on, you know, I don't do it alone. It, it takes my colleagues to help me do that and it takes the general public to move forward to help too. If it's not an important issue to the general public, legislators can say, eh, I don't really hear anything about it, so let's move on. So constantly communicating and, and staying active and vigil, and legislators read the paper, they read the letters to the editor, they see what's happening out there. So your vigilance, due diligence and vigilance um, <laughs> moving forward to keep it out in the forefront of public debate, um, especially, you know, we're going back into session the 4th, 5th, and 6th, we're not going back in until September. Keeping that active dialogue uh, throughout the entire, you know, next few months of saying we need pension reform you know you can write letters to the editor two papers you can do it once a month every month send it in send it in pension reform pension reform pension reform pension reform it is that important and if, that you're, a, important. if you're a member of a union you know if you're a member of a teachers union I know they send out a lot of information I can tell you I've seen the information they send out a lot of misinformation I mean the, the day that the that PSEA sent out their first piece of literature I thought well they said two things. Number one, this is the, the plan that the governor favors, right? Corbett plan, and number two, it discriminates against women. And I thought, well, number one, this doesn't discriminate against anybody. It treats everybody the same. And number two, that's guilt by association. That can never work. But they've been very effective at keeping it very short and sweet, and they've implanted in the minds of educators that the, if it's the governor is in favor of it, they should be against it, and people need to talk to the union and tell them that to rescue the benefits that I have earned the union should be in favor of meaningful pension reform. So it is six, seven, got about five more minutes until I'm gonna release you. If you didn't realize, we actually put crazy glue on each of your seats to make you stay the whole time. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So we'll take two more questions. And then uh, anything else, we'll, I'll, me and Mike will stay as long as we can to, to handle as many questions. How do they deal with it? Uh, there, I'm sorry, there, there has not been a Democratic proposal that has been submitted uh, for pension reform in the Commonwealth. I mean, this, this, some of the sound bites are that we should just, just stick with Act 120 and let it uh, run its course. Um, as I mentioned before, we're getting... Um, Senate Democrats put out a proposal to just do bonding. And if you're not familiar with bonding, um, other states, other local governments have done it. It's been a catastrophe. Uh, Illinois did a huge bond, and what they did was they bonded money to make their minimum payments. Their pension system, I mean, thank God, thank God we've never done a pension bond. I, I've looked at them, uh, I've looked at them hard. Uh, I have yet found any community that has initiated them anywhere in the United States to say, this was great and successful. Philadelphia did one. I know we pick on Philadelphia. Philadelphia did one. They still have pension concerns. Illinois did one. They still have pension concerns. What it does, and the argument is, it locks your, because right now pensions are kind of fluid. So you can talk about underfunding. If we don't put enough money in, you can put too much money in. Uh, what a pension obligation does is make it a hard 
amount of money you have to pay. The problem is you, you run the gamble of saying, we're going to get a low interest rate, so we'll make out on it at the back end. So you, you may reduce your pension cost short term, but you still have that bond to pay back. And that's where a lot of states get into trouble because they take that risk and it doesn't work out. Um, you know, just trust me, if you, if you Google Illinois on pension bonds and it will scare you, scare you. Yeah, so the moral of the story is the House Republicans or Democrats have not offered uh, a pension reform solution. The Senate Democrats have offered one and it's paramount to just, just borrowing money and infusing the system with cash and hopefully we would uh, exceed the rate of return the rate of return would exceed the, the, the interest on the bonds. I am confused. I have been under the impression that Governor Corbett wants more than what you are recommending. Is, am I wrong? Or what, what is he recommending? The, the governor uh, originally came out with a pension proposal, and uh, Representative Chris Ross uh, introduced that bill, and I think Senator Brubaker introduced it in the Senate. Uh, his bill was different. Um, at the end of the day, that piece of legislation that was introduced did come out with a fiscal note where the actuaries thought it would cost more money than it would save taxpayers. This program uh, is a result of you know, a compilation of work from really the administration, uh, myself, uh, the other members of the House and the Senate. Uh, it developed savings according to each actuarial firm that took a look at it. Um, I think that at this point in time, there's a proposal for meaningful pension reform that's on the table. I think if we get it across the finish line in the House and the Senate can act on it, that the governor would absolutely sign it. And part of about his plan, unfortunately, the governor twice has called for collars in our budget. And I, I got I to gotta highlight how dangerous that, that is. If you do a collar, you're suppressing your payment. So you're not funding your actual pension obligations. So any savings like Act 120, Act 120 was all about getting new spending. Governor Rendell, believe me, he's not a pension reform guy. It was all about getting new spending for his budget. He wanted to spend more money, but he had a pension problem. So he had to put, either put more money into his pensions or somehow lower his pension costs. So he said, well, let's do some reforms, get me some collars so I can spend more money in the budget. So that short-term suppression of the state's budget payments increase, ate up any savings you had long term, and then kind of exacerbated the problem we're in today. Had he not done the collars and done the reforms, we'd probably be in a better spot today, but that meant him not putting more money into the classroom and education, putting more money into wherever he spent <laughs> that more money, and that's a budget concern. For me, pensions are the primary goal. You have to fund that. That is a, a hard liability you need to fund. And you see it in, in local governments where they make pension determinations at collective bargaining time that increase costs in the out years. You need sustainability, um, and that's probably the most important part. If you have a sustainable budget or a pension system, you'll have a sustainable budget, and you'll have better <coughs> economic growth and, and better budgeting process moving forward. And that's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to that point where we have consistency in our budget processes, which is very, very critical. Shane, go ahead. General, general question. A lot of the uh, advertisements leading the election I've heard is taking, uh, applying a gas tax against uh, natural gas and, uh, and PA and applying that to education. And uh, is, is there, a, I guess to, to me the concern I have there, I'd like to hear what your input is, is just, it, it goes, <coughs> hey, that might be a one-shot wonder where you're going to get some taxes that will win, business will uh, adjust by probably moving somewhere else, whatever the case may be, but that money would not just be used for education. You know, I just believe that once it gets to Harrisburg, it's going to go to all other things, maybe a little bit to education, but as a, as a Pennsylvanian, I shouldn't expect that money to go to, if that idea to go through to be 100% for education, like retiring the $50 billion in, in pension liability. Yeah, so that $300 million has been spent in every single line item of the entire budget. So there's 9, 10, 11 different plans on spending a severance tax everywhere. Like, I would, and the funny part is, um, when, when I was a freshman House member under Rendell, I used to joke every Tuesday in budget season was Tax Vote Tuesday, and um, I'd wear my mob gear, and then um, 
I'd vote no on the tax increases. And every year it was every every they were trying to get a budget together with a tax increase, and you know Democrats were control of the House. They couldn't even get the votes <coughs> for these kind of things, and they bring it up, and it would blow up. They looked at um, other tobacco problems, cigarette taxes, all these other taxes to try to just get new spending and stuff like that. They couldn't even get the votes to do it. Uh, we did do an impact fee because ideally there is some impacts to natural gas drilling. Bulk of the money stays local. There's some that comes up to the state to deal with our impacts, transportation projects, health and safety, DEP permitting, which is important, PUC permitting on, on pipelines. Um, any severance tax would have to take into account that impact fee. So if you're looking to get $300 million out of severance tax, 200 of that has to maintain that funding level for the impact fee. So when somebody says, I want $300 million in a severance tax, they're really talking about half a billion dollars because you have to take that $200 million we already collect into consideration. The other thing you need to think about is total taxes. Every state has a different tax structure, and it's very difficult to compare them. Most people say, well, Texas has this rate of severance tax. They also don't have an income tax, and they also don't have corporate net income taxes. That is their tax structure to bring in their money, and at some point, it's going to go away. There's only so much oil underneath Texas. Now, in Pennsylvania, we're blessed. I've heard reports that we have more natural gas under this state than um, Saudi Arabia ever had in oil, and we're blessed to have that natural resource. Um, it's important to obviously protect the environment and do everything we can to uh, make sure we do it in a responsible way. But you know, to taxes to destroy. And businesses will look for a lower tax structure to do it. Um, Ohio did one, West Virginia did one. Um, God bless New York, they still have a moratorium. So we're still getting all those drillers in here and those drillers are Pennsylvania jobs, they're paying taxes here in Pennsylvania, we're reaping great rewards. And we have lower natural gas prices because of it, because we're close to the product. Simple economics. So home heating bills and stuff have been suppressed because we've had natural uh, gas development here in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, at some point, will there be, um, with enough pressure and enough push, probably anything can possibly happen in politics, but right now, this time frame, um, there's no guarantee a severance tax will go to education, because I guarantee people will put up on amendments, they'll put domestic violence protection. What legislator is going to vote against funding domestic violence? Put it up against abuse to, to help abuse kids. So, chink, chink, chink and soon you're down to $10 for education, $10 for this and that. So, so I, I want to thank you again yeah. for, being, for being so attentive. I want to yeah. thank you for understanding the issue, and I want to thank you in advance for letting your friends and neighbors and, and senators and representatives know how important this is for the future. I want to thank Seth for inviting me here this evening, and uh, a future member, I think, of the House, Kristen Hill, is joining us this evening, uh, who's doing her homework on all the issues, and, we got a chance to grab a bite deep before we came over here, so thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, and I'll stay as long as you want for questions, so thank you very much.